This episode is sponsored by JMR Rentals, professional digital cinema and broadcast rentals in Brooklyn, New York. To find out more, visit their website, jmrny.com. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and today on the program, we're taking a look back at the film festivals of 2020. Now, 2020 started off uh, pretty well, actually. It started off just much like any other year. But then everything changed due to COVID-19. So first, we're going to take a look before, in a world that was pre-COVID-19, at the Katra Film Series, the series grand finale in January, way, way back then. Our own E.J. Arginio was there to cover the red carpet and talk to some of the filmmakers. From the film and Life, we have Jean Goto, actress, writer, and director, and we have Adam Lim, who is also in the film and one of the film's producers. Guys, thank you for being here with us this evening. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us. us. Now, just tell us a little bit more about what and Life is about for those who already don't know at home. And life takes place in the future, and it's uh, an examination of how climate change might affect um, people who are little kids now, their future lives. And it's a little bit of a bleak story, mm -hmm. um, but hopefully one that inspires people to think about climate change and what it'll do to the next generation. Now, what does it mean to take a film that's so socially prevalent to the grand finale of the Katra film series? Oh my gosh, it's such a pleasure. It's such a pleasure because to me, this is something really near and dear to my heart and for it to reach more people and for it to connect with people um, is just an honor. Yeah, and, and it's exciting to hopefully inspire, spread the word, you know, like let's, let's talk about climate change. Uh, yeah, definitely. And it, it's not a very on the nose type of film, so it's something you have to read into. Uh, it, is a, it's a, it is a survival film, so it's surviving under harsh conditions. So yeah, it kind of it's a type of film where we're hoping to get have like help open discussion really about it. Yes. And I feel like it ends on a note of hope in some mm -hmm. ways, of and inspiration. Hope, yes. mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, maybe <clears throat> that positive feeling, not just all the negativity that we feel when we talk about climate change or right. hear about climate change. Excellent. Well, congratulations. And for those at home who want to hear more about you and your work, but mostly the film, where could they uh, visit online or learn more about that? It's under the production website, which is NavajoProductions.com. Uh, there is, uh, we have our Instagram feeds. Um, yeah. You can follow me at Jean Miyoshi Goto on Instagram. And you can follow me at Adam, I think it's Adam J. Lim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Wow, that's funny. I can't even, <laughs> that's so funny, yes. Or uh, if it's the production, it's Navajo Productions. For, well, it, yeah. well, Jean, Adam, congratulations on the success of the film, and we wish you the best of luck this evening. We're lucky enough to be here with Veronica Dang, writer, director, and actress of Extinct, as well as Aracio Gutierrez, producer for the film. Guys, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So what does it feel like to make it all the way to the grand finale of the Katra film series? It's been an amazing run. It's been an amazing year for our, our little film that we didn't expect to do as well as it did. So It's, it's such an honor. Amazing. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of other great yeah. films here. A lot of our friends are here, so we're just excited, excited to be part of this. Well, tell us a little bit more about what your film Extinct is all about. I can't say too much because there's like a twist ending, but basically um, we'd like to say that's about a, a woman who's like a recluse who's suddenly forced to live with a stranger. And it's sort of like odd couple meets Black Mirror. And what do you hope audiences take from the film? How Asian American community is like sort of minimized and uh, kind of forgotten. So it's kind of nice to see two uh, Asian leads. Uh, Grant Chang is my co-star who's been a Mr. Robot. I, think, I feel like that's the main issue is just sort of like relationships and that men and women don't necessarily have to be romantic in a, in a story. And, because it's a very unconventional uh, relationship. <laughs> and then sort of, we also discuss about like bioethics a little bit. It's definitely one, one of the things that people have watched it and just they, they, they see a lot of things in the movie. Like it ends up having like a lot of unexpected layers and levels. So it's uh, you know definitely a big shout out to the whole writing team and the whole creative team that just brought together very quickly a um, you know, such an amazing story. It stays with you. That's the nice thing. 
And where can uh, our audiences learn more about uh, your work as well as the film Extinct? My website's uh, iveronicadang.com. And after our final screening of our festival run at Catcha tonight, uh, we'll be posting it online at uh, Vimeo. Yep, we have a Facebook page for Extinct Film, yeah. iveronicadang.com and Extinct Film on Facebook. Just before the world went into lockdown, we were at the Winter Film Awards. Our own Kayla Vera was there on the red carpet. Kayla Vera for no rest of the weekend here with Irene Alameda. Hello, uh, great to be here. Yes, great meeting you. And the name of the feature film that you directed, produced, and wrote yep. is called The Alex's Strip. And what I know is that it's a Spanish film made in India. Tell us a little more about that. Well, it's a, it's a co-production, international co-production, Spanish, American, and Indian co-production uh, that we shot mostly in India and a few days also in Washington, D.C. and in Madrid. Wow, that sounds uh, very interesting. Tell us a little more about it. Well, it's a story about the father and daughter who reunite after 10 years. The daughter is 12 years old. And the father takes her to India for a business trip where he used to have a business company. And from there, they well, they have some confrontations. They don't know each other. And then there is a big adventure, an explosion, and things go on from, from there. And do you have a website for the film? Or where can we find it on social media? Well, it's just the title of the movie, Alex Strip. Uh, dot com or in Spanish is la cinta de Alex dot com. One of the features we reviewed for the Winter Film Awards was Daddy Issues, and I interviewed the sister team behind the film, Kimberly and Amy Datnow. I want to talk to you guys about your project. You guys uh, did a movie called Daddy Issues. What, give me like the log line. Give me like the Hollywood log line for the for the movie, just so people have a uh, in essence of the story and such. So Henrietta is a hapless 20 something comic that moves from London to LA when her father passes away. And when she gets to LA, she meets Nolan and Alice who are her two other college friends. And she realizes that they have similar sort of daddy issues to what she has. Nolan is dating a mum, and so has become a father. And you know, men have daddy issues too. Um, he's become a father not out of his own wanting to. And Alice is dating this older man and is a sugar daddy. And obviously Henrietta's father's died. So these three characters who are old friends come together. And it's a story about how people find humor um, in the darkest moments. Um, and it's a quirky slice of life comedy we also thought it's an important story to tell at this time with COVID and, and, and bringing fun to people's lives. Something uplifting, hopefully. Hopefully it's uplifting. <laughs> Once again, the film is called Daddy Issues. And uh, give me the website one more time. Well, um, the Instagram link is Clean Slate Productions and uh, the website is cleanslate-productions.com. And that'll be on, uh, on VOD uh, available uh, for anyone who wants to download it. Uh, thanks so much, guys, and, uh, you know, good luck. Filmmaker and friend of the show, James Oxford, founded his own film festival in his hometown of Tonkawa, Oklahoma. I asked James how the film festival came to be. So I want to talk about, because uh, we, we just, um, we had an episode recently that recapped the, the festival. Uh, my first question is, am I saying the name right? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you say, how is it pronounced? How is, it, how is the it's, proper pronunciation? It's a Tonkawa. Now that's your hometown? Born and raised, yep. I don't know where that is. I know it's in Oklahoma, but is it like a suburb of a city? Is it like, and kind of what inspired you to bring a film festival there? It is nowhere near a city. Um, it is a small <laughs> farm town of about 3,000 people. Um, it's about 20 miles south of the Kansas border in north central Oklahoma. Uh, it's about an hour and a half near, uh, away from the nearest airport and the nearest city. Um, so it is, is truly the middle of nowhere. And my parents are, uh, you know, cattle ranchers. And so, you know, that a lot of people from where I'm from, that's what they do. They're either farmers or they're cattle ranchers. Um, um, and then various other, uh, other types of things. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, uh, 
yeah, it's its own little, it's its own little place in the middle of nowhere. But um, as far as why we decided to uh, start a film festival, it actually started about six years ago. You know, we had done our first short film, The Demon, o uh, the Demon Deep in Oklahoma. And one of the very first film festivals we attended, um, my parents attended with us. And I'm not gonna name the name of the festival out of respect for them. Um, it was not good. <laughs> oh, really? Um, yeah, it was uh, very unorganized. Half the movies wouldn't play. Um, just And they had been going for 15 to 20 years. Like this was not their first film festival. They had been doing this every year for well over 15 years. And so at the time, my mom had said, I bet we could do a better film festival than this. I'm like, it would be fun to do at some point. Um, we just have to wait till the time is right. So cut to five or six years later, and my mom uh, was elected the president of the Chamber of Commerce uh, last year. And so we thought this might be the right time to try to organize an event like that in, in Tonkawa uh, and do it as an event through the Chamber of Commerce. And, and one of the things I'd said all along was when we do it, you know, I want to be able to be in a position to do it and organize it in the way that I want to um, so that I can use the experience that I've had going to film festivals all over the country and, and other parts of the world and take the things that they did well and, and incorporate that. And then I also wanted to take all the things that they did uh, not well and make sure that we avoided those same mistakes. Um, at which they were uh, uh, completely open to. Um, so about a year ago, about this time last year, I flew to Oklahoma and I just presented to the community. Um, I worked up a, a kind of a presentation. We had the mayor and his wife and we had, um, we have a small two-year college in my hometown called the Northern Oklahoma College. We had representatives from there. We had representatives from the Arts Council and then just various community members there um, who, most of them had never been to a film festival, um, had no idea what goes on at a film festival or what exactly that is. Um, and so I just kind of presented them to them, you know, here, here is what one is. And then two, here is kind of my vision for what one would look like in Tonkwa. Because I, want, I wanted us to be honest about it. I said, let's be clear that we are a small town. We are in the middle of nowhere. We are not the film capital of the world. We do not have mountains and skiing. We do not have beaches and oceans. Um, we do not have all those things that a lot of film festivals build around. You know, you go to the Vell Film Festival or you go to Sundance or you go to, uh, you know, the LA Film Festival. There's other things to do while you're at a film festival. I'm like, you know, we're gonna have to entertain people the whole time this is going on. So I was honest with them about what the the hurdles were going to be that we would have to overcome um and everybody was on board they're like 100 percent, you know whatever we need to do to overcome those those hurdles let's do it but then we also talked about the things that made tonkwa a great place to have a film festival which was it is a small town so because it's small with very little money and uh, not to you not requiring a massive number of people we can turn the town into a film festival town for that weekend. You know, it, we're not gonna be a drop in the bucket. We're going to be the thing that's going on in that town that weekend. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to do, um, kind of like a spoiled child was, I wanted a parade. And so <laughs> from, from the get go, I was like, I want a parade. I've never seen one at a film festival before. I want something that makes us unique. Um, and I think that would be something that was being interesting because I grew up riding in parades, um, you know, on our horses. We always rode our horses in the parade um, for Christmas and homecoming and, and various other things. And so I was like, I want to do that. I think that's a fun hometown experience um, to give the town and to also give the filmmakers. So anyway, so that, that, that's how it originated. So we, like I said, about this time last year is when we started and we, and we have the college which has really nice facilities. So, you know, we had good video quality, we had good sound quality, we had a nice, big, beautiful theater, um, which was important to me as well. As a filmmaker, I know what it's like to go to a film festival 
and not even be able to see my film or not be able to hear it or um, be set up in some weird little room on the side of a hotel somewhere uh, with a tiny little screen set up. And which is fine, you work with what you have, but I knew what we had was something that was better than that. I knew we had something that would really be a great experience. So, so yeah, so we started, everybody jumped in, pitched in, and we didn't really, I didn't even know what I was doing. I've never organized a film festival before. Um, attending one and organizing one are two completely different things. Um, but we dived in and um, pulled it off. It went, it went really well, we were very proud of it. The Brooklyn Film Festival went fully virtual for the first time in its history. One documentary featured at the fest was The Right Girls by Tim Wolfer. Here's what the director had to say when I asked him about his film. Tell us about the film. Like, Give me like the log line, like the Hollywood log line for the, the film and kind of talk about how it sort of came to be. So it's the story of four transgender women who uh, band together during the uh, migrant caravan that was coming across Mexico in 2018. And their whole, uh, their whole mission was to make it to the U.S. and uh, request asylum and set up a better future for themselves. The film came to be when I was reading a lot of the news and, and the rhetoric about, specifically coming from Trump, about like how these people were criminals and just saying these horrible inflammatory things. And I knew a lot of that uh, was not true from my experience working with migrants and uh, in the aid sector for the last 10 years. So I uh, simply just jumped on a plane one, one afternoon and flew down to southern Mexico and found the caravan. And within the first 24 hours, I found these girls on the side of the road or these women on the side of the road and uh, asked if I could follow them. And they said, uh, sure. So the next morning I followed them. And then the next morning I followed them again. And about six weeks later, we have the film you see today. And uh, for people who want to know more about you and about the movie, where can they find you on the web? So the easiest way to find the film is go to the Right Girls website, which is therightgirlsfilm.com. Uh, and then if you want to learn more about me, you can check out uh, my website, Wolfer Productions, or find me on Instagram at Tim Wolfer. In the summer of 2020, the biggest festivals in the world combined to form one massive online event. It would feature films from Tribeca, Sundance, Locarno, San Sebastian, Cannes, Berlin, Toronto, and more. We dedicated two full episodes into covering We Are One, a global film festival. We reviewed several of the movies there, including the documentary Rude Boy, which I discussed with NYC WebFest founder and friend of the show, Lauren Atkins. The documentary Rude Boy, yes. uh, the story of Trojan Records. I saw that. I thought it was really well done. So good. Uh, really good looking film. Uh, great interviews. Very, like, everybody seemed very frank. Good rapport there. Like, yeah, it was very intimate. He, yeah. And so, so this director, let me, I'm looking it up, Nicholas Jack Davis. So he's worked with a lot of different uh, musicians. That's kind of his thing. It's music video. I believe he's won a Grammy already and um, a, a few VMAs for music videos and documentaries. So there's definitely something about his rapport with music. What was really cool in this documentary is that we, we have someone being interviewed and then they would be talking about the song and then next thing you know, they'll be like singing a line from, like it was just really, really well done. And other people might be self-conscious to sort of behave like that, but he got that from several people. I thought he was, yeah, he, he knew his stuff, definitely. And you uh, felt like you were talking one-on-one -on -one to these singers. Yeah, and the reenactments I thought were really done well yeah. too. Because that, that's the hardest thing is like when you do a talking head interview as a filmmaker, it's like, okay, how am I going to illustrate this? Yes. How am I going to show it? But yes. the way they did it, it looked exceptionally good, like really nice cinematography, very good production value. Yeah. And uh, it also, you know, for a guy like me who, I mean, uh, reggae is not the first on my playlist right but it taught me a lot about that music and how yeah. a lot of this stuff came about and you know we had a british invasion in this country in the 60s but they had a jamaican invasion yeah which is there. really really cool uh, yeah and you know so I, was, I was like oh and there is british influence in that music absolutely know, which is i thought was just uh fascinating and and really something to learn about and you know this film if it hasn't already i'm sure we'll get to distribution somewhere mm -hmm. uh you know so rude boy the the story of trojan records 
definitely one to recommend and check yes. out. As 2020 was taken in the grip of the coronavirus pandemic, many festivals had to get creative. Would they go virtual? Would they create some sort of a socially distant in-person event? Or would they create a hybrid of the two? The Greenpoint Film Festival decided to go with a drive-in experience. They featured a wide variety of movies, and William Hammond, E.J. Argenio, and I reviewed several of the films in our preview episode of the fest. Here's William's review of Locked Alone. Okay, next up we have uh, Locked Alone, uh, directed by Yunjun Yang, and basically starring Claire Sue as in a one-woman show. There, there are other actors who flit in and out as we go, but it's really her film from beginning to end. She plays a, a college student who gets this super cheap apartment in Midtown Manhattan, but the moment the door closes, she is locked in. She cannot get out. And as it turns out, the, the place is haunted by the ghost of a serial killer who had a fetish for uh, young Asian women. There's a really strong Takashi Miike influence throughout the whole thing. Like, like I got a lot of audition vibes throughout the entire film. There's this wonderful static shot paranoia that pervades the entire thing. There, there are some silly elements like trying to communicate with the ghost via a homemade Ouija board, but you can put that stuff aside for just the sheer, not just terror of being isolated, but also the quite heavy elements of sexual assault that go through the whole thing. If you enjoyed this year's version of The, of the Invisible Man with Elizabeth Moss, this is kind of up that same alley. And if that's, if that's, on, that was a surprise hit. Um, so if you, if you were into that, this, this is the film that I think you would also enjoy. That is definitely not a comedy. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it sounds like it, it was like a thriller. Like it really held your attention. Yeah. Uh, there's tons of red herrings throughout the entire film and I won't give them any of them away, but everything along the walls, because this, this is a fully furnished apartment. So everything you see on a wall or, or on a bookshelf or in the kitchen, you wonder what, if any part, it's going to play. Uh, some things are referenced directly, some things aren't. But because of the immediate situation that this young woman is put in, and the way Claire Sue sells the performance, you're wondering what could go wrong where and how you're wondering what elements will, will play a part, which ones don't. There's like, your mind is racing the entire way. She's trying to find her way out of this supernaturally locked apartment, and you're trying to find her way out as a viewer. That's a pretty strong point in its favor. That sounds really cool. Do you, would you think, would you classify it more as thriller or horror? Like, where, how, where, um, how, what genre would, would you put it in? I, w I would say it's I would say it's more classic thriller than than horror. Like, like I said, there, there, there are strong Takashi Miike vibes, but it doesn't go to that more visceral torture porn type of area that he's such an expert in. Um, in fact, a lot of the violence is implied or or happens either off screen or in an obscured way. There, there there's there, there's a moment where she has to unfortunately mutilate herself for a small moment. And in more gratuitous films, this would be a grotesque graphic scene. And instead, it's more the camera, her, and a mirror, and she just sells the moment. It is very much a film that's dependent on, on the quality of Claire Sue's performance, and she plays it to the absolute hilt. The Soho International Film Festival, which usually happens in the summer here in New York, held the 11th edition of the fest virtually this year in October. Kayla Vera and I were there to cover the virtual red carpet on opening night. Here she is talking with Gretel Claggett, the director of Storm Chaser, which also won acclaim at this year's Starable Fest. So we're here with Gretel Claggett, the writer-director of Storm Chaser. Gretel, congratulations. Tell us, how does it feel to be here today at the Soho International Film Festival? Oh, thank you, Kayla. It's so wonderful to be a part of the Soho International Film Festival. It's actually the first time um, that I've had a project in the festival. I've known about it for a number of years, and uh, I am based out of uh, Greenwich Village in uh, New York City, so really great. Um, even though it's virtual, great to be, you yeah. know, someplace that's uh, New York born and bred. 
and uh, I'm at GretelClaggett.com. Congratulations again, and good luck at the festival. Thank you so much, Greta. Thanks. And that's all we got for you today. Thanks so much for taking this trip down the rabbit hole for more film festival coverage, including interviews with film festival founders, filmmakers, as well as our movie reviews. Visit our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Once again, I'd like to thank all of our correspondents, reviewers, and guests that we've had this year. You guys have made this a memorable one in a good way. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, JMR Rentals. They've been great in loaning us gear to review and to use to make the show. Couldn't have done it without you guys. And uh, I'd also like to thank you, the, the viewers and the listeners out there, for supporting the show. It means the world to me and, and means the world to everybody who works on the show. So, you know, please keep liking and sharing and, and build the support so we can make more of these for you in 2021. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.